Okay, in this section I'm going to talk about the Otto cycle. Um, so I'm going to describe um, what it is in terms of the relation to internal combustion engine. Um, sort of talk you through the steps. Then I'm, I'm then going to show you how to derive the thermal efficiency for an Otto um, cycle from first principles. So what I've got on the screen here is this is a pressure um, volume plot. Um, pressure on the y-axis, volume on the x-axis, and I'm going to show you each of the different um, strokes of a, a internal combustion engine, and we're going to see how they relate to the changes in pressure and volume as we go around the cycle. So we're starting off in the sort of bottom left-hand corner of this plot, so low pressure and uh, uh, small volume. So this is top dead center. Um, this is right at the, the top. So the first thing we have is we have an induction stroke, okay? So the cylinder will move down in the piston, the inlet valve will be open, and we draw fresh air and fuel, depending on the design of the engine, into the cylinder. And this process, I should say, this, we're looking, um, thinking of an ideal cycle. So in an ideal world, this process would be isobaric, okay? So there'd be no change in pressure. The, the air would just flow um, into the cylinder. And that continues till the um, piston reaches bottom dead center or maximum volume in the cylinder. And this is now at state one. So now what happens is when the um, piston is at the bottom, the inlet valve closes and the piston moves up and compresses the gas. So we're now going from state one to state two. Now. As you can see, we're, we're compressing the gas, so we're doing work on the gas. So we're adding work into our cycle, so hence the arrow here. So this is work in to our cycle. And this is um, considered to be an isentropic process. And I'll um, sort of come back to the assumptions at the end, but just concentrate on the strokes for the minute. Okay, so we inducted some air, we've closed the valves, and we've compressed it up to state two. And there obviously there's fuel in here as well. So the next thing that happens is we have combustion. So the fuel and air mixture is ignited using a spark plug um, in an auto cycle and the fuel burns. And because it burns, um, the gas gets hotter. Um, so the temperature increases and because there's no change in volume, its pressure will increase. And so we, we have so you can see this is a line going straight up on this plot from state two to state three. And what we've done here thermodynam thermodynamically is we've added heat into our, um, into our system, okay? Then we have our, um, obviously we, we've heated the gas and we've created a lot of temperature and pressure and that now forces um, the piston down. So gas has got nowhere to go but because this um, piston is free to slide up and down in the cylinder um, that pressure acts on this area which creates a net force which is then pushing the piston down okay so this is now work out this is obviously what we're trying to get out of this engine we're trying to extract work um, from um, the fuel it's a heat engine we're putting heat in we're getting work out then Finally, when it gets to the bottom, which is um, state four on our PV plot, then the exhaust valve opens and the piston is um, pushed back up again. Um, but because the exhaust valve is open, we can push out the exhaust gases um, and obviously they go into the exhaust. Now, because these um, exhaust gases still have some residual heat in it, we can think about this as extracting heat from the system, okay? So we're pushing out hot gases, so we're extracting heat from our system. We're do when we're doing that isochorically, so constant volume, and now you can see that we've returned back to our original state, okay? So we've gone round, we've inducted air, um, we've combusted it, we've extracted work from it, and we've exhausted it, okay? So I'm just going to talk about um, some of the assumptions now. So during the induction stroke, um, and the exhaust stroke it should be said, 
we assume that no work is done during these strokes, okay? So it's isobaric, so the same work is done going one way as it is the other. We also assume that um, during the compression stroke, um, there's no heat transfer, so therefore, um, say adiabatic, and if it's reversible, then it's isentropic. We also um, assume, which is reasonable assumption, actually, that gasoline, um, you know, burns quite fast. Um, and so because it burns very fast, there's um, not much change in, uh, because it burns very fast, we're say, what we're saying here really is that it's burning instantaneously, okay? And if it burns instantaneously, then there's no change in volume. So we get an isochoric um, heat addition. And as we assumed with the compression stroke on the, the power stroke or the expansion stroke, we assume that there's no heat transfer during that stroke and therefore that is isentropic also. And then finally, in the same way that we assumed that combustion occurred instantaneously, we assume that there's an instantaneous exhaust of um, gases out of the exhaust valve. Okay, so we've gone around that. And that's what it looks like um, for an ideal cycle. So just to show you what that would look like on a TS diagram, so temperature um, entropy plot, okay? So if you remember the the um compression com sorry the compression stroke we assume to be isentropic. So if this is a TS plot and S is entropy, then that's going to be a straight line on this plot. So we're increasing temperature, we're putting work in, um, but because it's constant entropy, the line goes straight up. Then as we increase the temperature through the combustion, um, which is isochoric, we have an increase in temperature, but we also have an increase in entropy. Um, during the, so that's for the actual sort of, you know, instantaneous combustion. We then have the power stroke, which we assume is isentropic, as with the compression stroke. And then finally, we um, sort of close the, close the loop um, with a reduction, with um, decrease in temperature and entropy during the exhaust stroke. Um, to get back to state one. Okay, so it's important to know what um, each of these cycles looks like on both a pressure volume uh, plot and also a TS plot. Okay, and to understand what's happening um, it, for each of the processes. Okay, so with that in mind, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to derive the um, thermal efficiency for an auto cycle from first principles. Okay. So I should say, actually, before I begin, that you, you won't get this first time. You might have to watch this video a few times over to understand it, but that's OK. You know, it, it does take a bit of time, but just bear with me. So if you don't get it first time, or if you're getting lost, just persevere with it, watch it a few times. You, you'll get it in the end. So in terms of thermal efficiency, well, the, the thermal efficiency of anything is um, what you want out which in this case is work, over um, uh, heat in. Okay, so thermal efficiency is work out over heat in. It's quite a basic um, uh, formula there. So we're going to apply that to this auto cycle. And what we're going to do is we're going to show that the thermo, thermal efficiency for an auto cycle is just purely a function of the compression ratio. If you remember, I talked about that in the introduction and the ratio of the specific heats, gamma. Okay, so how do we get there? So starting with the um, first law of thermodynamics, so hopefully you recognize this one. If you don't, please go back and look at um, your first year notes. This should be clear to you. So the change in internal energy is equal to the net um, heat transfer minus net work that's done on the system. Okay, so if we think about our um, auto cycle, the change in internal energy is zero, okay? So just think about it. If you look up here in the corner, so let's say we start at point one, okay? We put some work in, we put some heat in, we get some work out, and we reject some heat. Now we've ended up at the same pressure and volume, and we've got the same mass of gas in there. So the, the heat and work that we put in is equal to the 
heat and work that we've taken out. So it has to equal zero. Okay, so if delta U is zero, then um, what we're saying is the net work done is equal to the net heat. Okay. So therefore, if we look at our thermal efficiency equation, so the work done, okay, is equal to W net, but W net is equal to Q net, so the heat, the net heat um, supplied is what is what's gone in minus what's gone out, so Q two to three minus Q four to one, and all that's divided by the heat in, and the heat that we put in is Q two to three. Okay, so just take a moment, pause the video to just just make sure that you can get get to this from what I've shown you on this slide. Okay, so that's the equation I had for the thermal efficiency in terms of heat from the previous slide. Now, if you remember that the, um, the heat supplied is equal to MCV delta T, okay? So we can substitute um, this equation into the top one you see here. Obviously, we need to make sure we have the, the um, relevant subscripts for the right temperatures, okay? So two to three, uh, four to one, and so on. So what we've done now is we've written the thermal efficiency um, of this Otto cycle in terms of temperature effectively, because what you might have noticed here is that we've got MCV in every term, so they all cancel. So um, they all cancel, and then we have, by um, a little bit of rearranging, because you can see we've got T3 minus T2 over T3 minus T2, we can rearrange to get this. So you can see we're, we're nearly there. If you remember, um, a couple of slides ago, we said the, the thermal efficiency was equal to one minus a function of R. Okay, so we've already got that one minus in there. We're, we're part of the way there. Okay, so we've got to the point now. So if we can just find the temperatures at each point in the um, uh, in our cycle, you know, we can work out the thermal efficiency. Okay, but I'm going to show you an easier way to do that. Okay, so again, just make sure that you can get to this solution at the bottom of this slide here. Right, so what we've done is we started off with um, the basic formula for thermal efficiency, which is work out overheat in, and using some of the, the first laws of thermodynamics, we've shown that we can write the thermal efficiency in terms of temperatures. So to kind of break this down further, I'm going to show you how um, this thermal efficiency can be simplified. And I'm going to do it using the following process. And again, you won't get this first time, but you might take a couple of goes to look over it, but you, you will get it. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to express the thermal efficiency in terms of temperature ratios between each of the states. So between 1 and 2, 2 and 3, 3 and 4, and so on. Okay. The um, second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write all the processes um, as you go around this cycle in terms of temperature ratio and then because I've got my thermal efficiency in terms of temperature ratio and I have equations for all my different processes in terms of temperature ratio I can substitute one into the other simplify and get my thermal efficiency okay so as I said you won't get this first time just just have another go at it it will come okay and it will make sense um, once you've been through it once or twice Okay, so I'm going to express the thermal efficiency in terms of temperature ratio. So, sort of the way I'm doing this is I'm effectively sort of factorizing, you know, these brackets. So this is what I started off with. But if I take T1 out of the top bracket, okay, so I can write um, T4 over T1, and I can take T2 out of the bottom bracket and write it like this, okay. And I can use a little bit of a mathematical trick here because I'm not interested, as you'll see later, in the temperature ratio between um, 4 and 1. Um, so I want to try and get rid of this, and you'll sort of see why later. So the way that I can get rid of that is I can actually rewrite this term as these three terms. So I've written it as T4 over T3, T3 over T2, T2 over T1, okay, and you can see this is exactly the same thing because the T3s cancel, 
and the T2s cancel and it leaves me the right thing. But as you'll see, this is this is a better way to have it because I can actually write the process in terms of these temperature ratios, um, which is what I'll show you on the next few slides. Okay, so I'm gonna write the process now in terms of temperature ratio. So as we go from state one to two, um, we can use the um, polytropic um, equations that I showed you in the introduction. Okay, so the ratio between T1, T2 and T1 is equal to V1 over V2 um, to the gamma minus one. Now remembering that um, the volumes, the volume at one, which is your maximum volume over the volume at two, which is your minimum volume, that's the compression ratio. Okay, so I can write the um, the temperature ratio between one and two in terms of the compression ratio. Okay, so this equation, so I've done the first one. So now I'm gonna look at it between two and three. As I go between two and three, I can use the ideal um, gas law, um, PV equals MRT, and if I rearrange that, I can end up with um, the uh, temperature ratio between those two being equal to the pressure ratio between those two states, okay? And I've got a term here, RP, which is the pressure ratio, okay? So that's the temperature ratio between these two states is equal to the um, pressure ratio between these two states. And then Finally, we want uh, an expression, a temperature ratio between um, states three and four. So as we did for the compression stroke on the expansion stroke, we can use the same equations and the temperature ratio between um, three and four is equal to the volume ratio, um, sorry, the temperature ratio between four and three is equal to the volume ratio between three and four to gamma minus one. And if we notice here that the volume at three is also equal to the volume at two because it's isochoric, yeah? And also the volume at four is equal to the volume at one. So I can substitute those. And if you notice that this, what's in this bracket is the inverse of what's in this bracket. So effectively what I've got in here is an expansion ratio, if you think about it, okay? Which is the inverse of the compression ratio. So you can see that this term is just the inverse of this term, okay? Because we're compressing it here, so we've got the compression ratio and we're expanding it, and the, the expansion ratio is the inverse of the compression ratio. Okay, so I now have my thermal efficiency written in terms of temperature ratios, and I have the each of my processes written in terms of temperature ratios. So now I can substitute. So I'll do that on the next slide. So if I substitute in my um, temperature ratios into the, the equation I had, you can see this is what I end up with. Um, obviously it looks uh, a bit of a mess, but you can do some uh, cancelling on here and let me just see if I can do that for you now. So get this pen up so I can see I've got um, R to the gamma minus one cancels with this term because they're the inverse of each other. And now I end up with um, this pressure ratio minus one over this pressure minus one. So that whole thing um, cancels, okay? So you can see what I'm left with now is thermal efficiency is equal to one minus one over the compression ratio to gamma minus one. Okay. So we got there in the end. And as I say, have a look at that a couple of times and hopefully it makes sense. So what I've shown here now is I've actually plotted um, the, um, the efficiency, the thermal efficiency versus compression ratio that I just derived on the previous slides. So you can see this is the, I you should obviously state this is the ideal um, thermal efficiency because we assumed it's an ideal cycle against compression ratio. Now you can see that obviously as you keep um, increasing the compression ratio, the um, thermal efficiency uh, keeps increasing. Obviously it starts to plateau, plateau at some point, but it keeps increasing. So why then, um, question for you, pause and have a think, is for um, gasoline engines, if you if you look them up, um, tend to have a compression ratio in the order of eight to 12, okay? So we're in sort of this order. So why don't we have higher compression ratios and get 
high efficiency. What's limiting the compression ratio? Something must be, because otherwise they would have done it by now. Okay, and the answer is um, knocking, pinging, all terms that um, relate to sort of abnormal um, combustion of fuel in the engine. So basically what happens is, <clears throat> as you keep pushing up the pressure ratios, um, the fuel doesn't combust as you want it to. It doesn't combust in a controlled way. So you're kind of pushing the fuel beyond its limits, not the materials, okay? And um, that is sort of described as um, what's called the research octane number. And this is a measure of the fuel's knocking characteristics. And you've probably seen this um, either knowingly or unknowingly. Um, so if you drive drive um, a car or a bike or a motorbike or whatever, you would have seen this number without uh, realising it. So you see it on the pump every time you fill up. Okay, so the research octane number. So um, in Europe for regular unleaded fuel, it's a one of 95. And basically what this number means is it's, um, so it's called the research octane number. So it's the ratio, it's the ratio of isooctane to heptane that would have the same knocking characteristics as your fuel. Okay, so an iso octane would have a one of a hundred, and heptane on its own would have a one of zero. So, for example, a fuel with a one of ninety has the same knocking characteristics as a mixture of ninety percent iso octane and ten percent heptane. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So, the the higher the ron, the more susceptible. Um, sorry, the, the less susceptible the fuel is to knock in, and so therefore you can have higher compression ratios, so in theory your engine can run more efficiently, more efficiently. okay? So that sort of concludes this um, uh, little section on Otto Cycle. Um, thanks for listening.